Welcome to episode 16 of the Movie Muse podcast and our second bite-sized edition. In this show we'll be focusing on Film Club, our regular feature where one of the team chooses a film, we all watch it and share our thoughts. The latest pick was chosen by me and is the 2013 British suspense thriller Last Passenger. Joining me as always to review this movie are Simon Burton. Good evening. And Gordon Sinclair. Hello. Well, the reason I found this film was because I got a £1 credit to use against Amazon Video after buying a Blu-ray from there, and this film was amongst those that were 99p to rent, so it was effectively free, and it also sounded quite interesting. Last Passenger stars Do Gray Scott as Lewis Shaler, an A&E doctor and widower who boards a late-night commuter train to Tunbridge from London with his young son Max. As the journey progresses, the number of passengers thins out, and when the train misses his stop, Shaler attempts to speak to the driver via the intercom and discovers that the train has been taken over by somebody that intends to crash it, though his motive remains a mystery. Shaler must therefore work with the other five remaining passengers to try and stop the train before it hurtles to its disastrous destination. The film also stars former EastEnders actress and Strictly Come Dancing winner Cora Toynton as a woman that flirts with Shayla earlier in the journey, David Schofield, who was in American Werewolf in London and Pirates of the Caribbean, as a grumpy and unhelpful commuter, and Edo Goldberg as a fair dodging traveller with a flair for magic. The lineup of passengers is completed by Joshua K. Narma as Shayla's son and Lindsay Duncan as a grandmother on her way home from Christmas shopping. The film was directed by Omid Nushin in his feature film debut. He also co-wrote the film, which was featured on the 2008 Brit list of the Best Unproduced Scripts, and the director was nominated for the Best Debut Director Award for the film at the 2013 British Independent Film Awards. So, a little bit of trivia about the film. The budget for the film was $2.5 million, most of which came from investment from the BFI, Pinewood Studios and Pathé. Long before it went into production, in order to generate interest in the film, Nushin produced a trailer shot for just £500. Principal photography took place at Shepperton Studios and lasted just 26 days, and the film is set on board two Class 421 EMU train carriages, and is set in 2004 when slam door trains were still in service, apparently. Despite being part of an electric train, artistic license was used and the carriages were portrayed as diesel-powered for the purpose of the storyline. While much of the film was produced in a studio, several scenes were shot on moving trains on the Bluebell Railway in Sussex and the Kent and East Sussex Railway Heritage Line. During development, Nushin met with Weta Workshop Special Effects head Richard Taylor, who is a big train fanatic and a supporter of the project, but ultimately it was deemed too expensive to produce the film in New Zealand, so all digital effects were done by Tim Smith, a Dutch visual effects artist who worked on the original trailer. Sound effects editor Ilam Hoffman and his team created a language for the train so that it would become as much a character in the film as the passengers. They used animal sounds such as lions, tigers and cobras, morphed with the train sounds to give the locomotive an animalistic quality. I think we're the last people on this train. This is us. I don't believe them. That's my style. Hello? How many passengers? What? How many passengers left? Do any of you remember Morgay? I never proved what caused it. Speculation at the time was driver suicide. When the train came into the station, it accelerated. Whoever this man is, he wants to go out with a bag. My son is on the street. We'd like to get off now. This isn't funny! Oh, my God. They can't cut the power. It's a diesel train. Then how can they stop us? I don't think they can. I have an idea. So, what did we all think of it? Gordon, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Well, I thought it was quite a nice British thriller with a low-budget cast consisting of the poor man's Gerard Butler and the blonde barmaid from EastEnders. 
if it's not being too generous, it actually felt a little Hitchcockian in places with the traditional characters all present and correct. We had the handsome-ish hero, the hard man, the angry man, the kid and the Dolly Dimples that you just don't know whether you can trust her or not. And at times throughout, I thought every character in the film was in collusion with some nefarious person behind the takeover of the trains. It left you thinking, what's causing this? What's the reason why it's happening? Why is this happening? And I think that's credit to it, that it could keep that tension and keep that lack of clarity about what's going on there. So I felt like as a viewer, I was as in the dark as the people on the train were. So I felt like I was the seventh passenger, which, you know, I'll give him a lot of credit for that. But what that means is when the final conclusion actually came together, it was a bit disappointing, to be honest, because I'd thought of so many different reasons for what was going on that what was in my head turned out to be much more exciting than how the film finally ended. The score and the actual shooting of the film were poor. I thought the score in particular was pretty bad. But on the whole, the whole film was enjoyable. It was thrilling and it was quite exciting. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Gordon. Simon, what were your thoughts? Well, this meant a lot to me, this film, because I used to commute on that exact same line. So I know all about it. I know all the area. I know everything that he mentions, all the places and bits. So it has quite a lot of meaning to me in a way. That made me enjoy it and also annoyed me in places you know, you've got to allow for artistic license and certain things. But the thing about the train being diesel was fine, but there were very few diesel trains around that time in that area. But then it makes it more interesting in the story because of what happens at the end. So the electric train, you just turn the power off and it rolls to a halt and nothing can be done. So they actually say that in the film, which is quite clever. But anyway, the thing with me is when they first start out on the train, it's just very contrived and the train characters were just so overblown and really so stereotypical of late night commuters, but just over the top. Most people just, there was a bit of noise and everyone just fell asleep and was just drunk on the trains. This was like all the people shouting and bawling. The Polish guy gets on and was really abused and smoking. Yeah, you get the old guy like that, but it was just the way he was confronted by the older chap. The guard was the most unconvincing train guard I've ever seen in my life. So hammy, beyond cringeworthy hammy it was to me. Especially when he had to go to the guy because his kid, I knew he was going to fall out the door. The door was going to open. That was so predictable. I didn't like that at all. All that early stuff was dreadful. But the film got better when it got less people and then the actual tension started. There were inconsistencies with the train and the route and stuff, but that's only because you knew that. So that's just, for me, it just hurt me in the story. But the actual suspense and the tension was really effective. And as it went on, it was quite a roller coaster whether they were going to get out of this. The guy driving it who'd taken over the train, you see him vaguely in the vestibule where he's in between the carriages and then he has a drink of something and then you don't know anything about him again. You see the guard get pulled in and something happens to him and then you just don't know anything about the driver. He speaks on the intercom and just says a couple of words and it's so mysterious what this guy's about. And that was really good. I did like that fact and I could really feel their anger and wanting to smash into the driver was to try and get to him that did make me feel like what Gordon said about being another passenger on the train one thing that hurt me is when they managed to stop the train in that tunnel but they couldn't get out because the doors at the side were you couldn't open them which is fine because that was very accurate to that line because they had special trains that were narrow that used to go through them then when they electrified it they had the standard gauge stop so they only go through on a single track but I don't think they're that close to the wall that you couldn't get out but anyway but earlier in the film they break into the driver's cab at the other end of the train and they've got the key to open the back door the reason they don't do it is because the train's going too fast they could kill themselves by jumping out the back of the train but the minute it stops in that tunnel, you've got the key, go straight back down and climb out. The way they forgot about that, that annoyed me as well. But there you go. They wouldn't keep the story going, would it? So you can't look at sensible stuff like that. But what I did like about it was the tension got built up and up and up. But like Gordon said, I just thought the ending was so disappointing. It was just such an anti-climax. And it just really killed it off for me at the end. So they didn't even hit buffers at Hastings Station. OK, oh, it's finished. For me, inaccuracies in the train thing, which won't mean anything to anybody else unless you know the line, but it hurt me because I knew it. And the ending was just an anticlimax to nothing. So not a bad film, not one I'd ever watch again. Wasn't over excited about it. It was all right, but not great. Mm, I feel a little bit differently about some of those points you've made, but just for what I thought was pretty decent about it, for the budget, it was pretty well made. Some of the camera work was a bit ropey, but I did read that the reason a lot of the camera work was inside the train, other than to make you feel like you were a passenger, was just due to basically the lack of budget and the lack of space to do the filming because they were using real train carriages that they weren't allowed to rip the seats out of. As you mentioned, the train guard was awful, and a lot of the actors in the early part of the film were obviously not 
of very good quality actors but once the main cast got going it was just them i thought it was pretty well acted it had a bit of a retro style to it it was a bit like a sort of 70s disaster movie at times and it definitely had 70s style opening titles you know all the yellow and all that kind of stuff was quite retro like you said Cy, a bit slow to get going the first half hour was a bit boring but ultimately the build-up attention was good and then it was maintained throughout to the end of the film i thought the two big effects sequences which was the train crashing into the car at the level crossing and the finale they seemed pretty well done considering again it was a low budget i think the fact that everything was done in the dark probably helped there because you don't have to worry too much about what's going on around it you could just focus on the fire effects and all that kind of stuff i actually liked and i think you said that you liked the fact that the driver wasn't really really revealed but i liked the fact there was no real resolution to the film about what his motives were or what he was doing he was just a nut job who'd got on a train and was going to crash it basically as far as we could tell and that was good enough for me it kind of reminded me of the steven spielberg film duel in the the driver's not really the enemy in duel the truck was the enemy and in this the train's the enemy and they're just trying to get off the train or stop the train so that they can escape and the driver's just incidental really the bad sides of it i thought i found it very unbelievable that 33 ish year old cara toynton would be interested in a guy 15 years older than her with an eight-year-old kid or however old he was she didn't really play much of a role in the film at all other than a bit of eye candy as i mentioned the first 15 to 20 minutes were a bit boring although i do get that they were probably trying to establish the relationship between the characters during that period and as you mentioned side si, there's some really silly moments from the characters the one you mentioned about why didn't they jump out the back door but also when they finally derail the last carriage why is dugray scott standing in the one that isn't going to get derailed it didn't seem to make any sense that he was stood there they were still joined together at that point as they decoupled them he only had to jump a foot to get onto the other side but overall i thought it was an enjoyable film some thrilling moments and better than many films with a bigger budget i think so let's quickly go around the team then let's start with what did you think was the best scene in the film Gordon, do you want to go first? I kind of struggled with this a little bit. I did really like the level crossing scene because that was unexpected. And what's interesting that I found out after watching it is that earlier on in the film, there's a group of rowdy teens or early 20s on the train. And apparently it's those same people who are in the car that gets hit on the level crossing, which I thought was quite interesting. I'd like to watch it again and see if you can see whether it is or whether that's just a concept you're supposed to accept. So I liked that, but I wouldn't call it a favourite scene because tons of films do cars getting hit at level crossings. So I think the bit that I will pick, I wouldn't call it a scene, but the angry old man, when he falls through the gap between the trains, just because it was so unexpected. I was still at that point thinking that he was a bad guy and he had something to do with the driver. And then he just fell through the gap and was gone. And he was like, oh, what's happened there? (laughs) I think just the unexpectedness of how that character disappeared, I'll class that as my favourite scene. Fair enough. Sight? Gordon's spoken about my scene before he mentioned his own there. It was the, my bit was level crossing. I can't see how those revenues could be the same people. They got off at the station 20 miles up the road and how they got there before a train that hadn't stopped anywhere. I don't see how that could happen, but maybe it is, I don't know. And the station they chose that they said the level crossing was out is wrong. It's actually a station from one further on, but <laughs> that's not going to make any difference. But I know the road where that is, but that level crossing wasn't on the Hastings line. That was in Berkshire somewhere. Milford is the name of the place. Yeah, that jump scare, I didn't expect that because it was filmed from another car. So you're looking at the view of someone in another car looking at them go past. And then the car drives on and I did, jump a bit i didn't expect the train to just suddenly appear and smash them out of the way because you expect on a level crossing especially when there's a runaway train on it they'd still put the barriers down and all the lights would be flashing and the car would have to stop but because i don't understand why that wasn't happening there's a train it's even more reason that it needs to be stopped why is the barriers not down but it was a good scene because i didn't expect it to happen i thought it would go just in front of them or something they drove towards i thought oh what's going to happen here next week boom it was well done it was very believable the, the bit where the car was hit made my stomach go a bit weird i was like oh my god that is dreadful it was quite harrowing to be honest 
Okay, well, mine was a scene that you mentioned, size being quite predictable, and it was predictable, but even predictable jump scares can still make you jump, and it was when, in the first 20 minutes or so, the kid kept messing around with the door handle of one of these slam doors, and his dad tells him not to mess around with it, and then he does it again, and it comes open and he nearly falls out, and that did make me jump. What's his diagnosis? Um, he's crazy. What did I tell you? What did I just tell you? These doors are dangerous, Max, and you never touch them. You never touch them. I guess you kind of knew it was coming, but I also kind of assumed that they'd be locked, you know, because I don't remember ever travelling on a train like that in recent memory, so I couldn't remember whether they'd have some master central locking kind of thing going on when the train's in motion. So yeah, that was probably the best moment out of the first half hour of the film as well. So let's move on to best character. My favourite character was the guy you mentioned, Gordon, the grumpy commuter, Peter Carmichael, played by David Schofield, who was one of the dart players in The Slaughtered Lamb in American Werewolf in London in his younger years. What I liked about him was his just complete disdain for any action or ideas that the other passengers came up with. It didn't matter what they came up with as a positive thing. He just said, you shouldn't do that. Or everything was basically going to make him late for wherever he was going or whatever. So he does become a bit more helpful and positive as the film progresses and a bit more more heroic but i liked him as the grumpy commuter simon what was your favorite character my favorite character was ido gobo's character jan klimowski the polish guy initially he's just the aggressive late night smoking when he shouldn't be loon but he becomes indispensable when the gravitas of the situation becomes apparent and i like his bravado and aggressiveness takes over and he keeps wanting to say oh, i can do this i can do that but it isn't actually him that saves the day but his hostility wanes as the film progresses as they all come together and they all know they're in a bad situation it's that bit when he's trying to go outside the train and he says i'll do it i'll do it and what i liked about it just before the grumpy guy goes up with the race got to go and try and split the train he was going to do something and he just turns around to him and says Jan will you just listen to me for once this time and he sort of goes oh okay and they sort of look at each other and you think oh, perhaps they can get on and they see after all this bitching and sniping at each other there's a little bit of respect there and then obviously the other guy goes up and then falls out so that never gets explored but I liked him I thought at the start he's the aggressive idiot but his character was great throughout the film after that and it made quite a lot of difference to me on it to be honest okay Gordon have you got a different oh. character or one of those two I've got a different character, but I found this quite difficult because I don't think the film has any standout characters. It is very much an ensemble between the six passengers. And even Doug Ray Scott, I don't think particularly stands out in his own right. But as a group, it seems to work well. And I think the difference between the characters is good. But I suppose the one that I would pick out is Cara Tynton's character. I think she played it well. There was enough suspicion that she wasn't on the level that it made her character interesting. And I don't think she was just there for the eye candy. I think she added something to that ensemble. So stick her down as my favourite character. But like I say, I think you have to take the six as a whole because if you break them down individually, I think possibly they're all a bit weak. Yeah, fair point. I'm surprised you didn't choose the train as your favourite character, Si. <laughs> yeah, very true. Yeah, there was too much inaccuracies there for me, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, did anyone have a favourite line from the film? Yeah, I think I'll go with Simon's favourite character, Jan, at the end of the film where he says, if I bought tickets, I could have got refunds. <laughs> But yeah. you probably didn't say it in a Pakistani accent like that. <laughs> no. There was a bit of humour in the film, wasn't there, as well, which I think helped it in some yeah. ways. Sai, what was your favourite line? My favourite line was when Dewey Scott looked out the window and he saw the guy crawling away from the tracks. He went, hi, I'm on a train. There's been an accident on the Hastings line, somewhere between Seven Oaks and Tunbridge. And what I liked about that was it's not the Hastings line until it gets past Tunbridge and it splits off. That's the main, <laughs> that's the actual Dover line that it's on. So that's why I like my favourite line, because it's so wrong. <laughs> OK, well, for my favourite line, I'm going to pick the one time you hear from the mysterious driver and he says, how many passengers are left? And that's it. But it's quite sinister because it's like, has he basically been waiting for there to be a certain number of passengers left before he decides to commit his dastardly deed? Or was he just interested in how many people he's going to kill? So I quite like that line. So let's just give our ratings for the film then. So I'm going to give it three and a half stars. Simon? I will give it two and a half stars. OK. And Gordon? I'm also going to give it three and a half. I feel like that might be ever so slightly nice to the film, but I think it's definitely three and a bit. 
so I'm going for three and a half. Yeah, that was my reasoning as well. It's quite an admirable example from the director and the producers of just not giving up on a project, given that the script Mm. was written five years earlier and it took them so long to get it funded. So for them to actually produce something that isn't just the normal sort of film that would get made for $2 million, that's a naff action film or some kind of half-arsed British crime thriller, I think was a reasonable achievement. Yeah, I think that's really well put. Okay, we average out the score and that gives it an average rating of 3.2, which puts it in 7th place on our leaderboard between them and Secret of Kells. That concludes this episode and Film Club. All we need to know is what are we going to have for our next Film Club and it'll be Gordon's pick next time. Okay, well, because the new Star Wars film is due later this year and a lot of people are interested in the director, Ian Johnson, I thought we could look back at one of his films. I think most of us have seen Looper and all enjoyed it, but we've probably not all seen his earlier film, which is a contemporary noir film called Brick. So that's what we'll be going for. Brick, directed by Ian Johnson. Thank you very much, Gordon. Our next Film Club episode will come up at some point in the future and we'll be discussing Brick. So that rounds off this podcast. Our next podcast will be coming up in a few weeks' time, hosted by Gordon. So Gordon's going to tell us what that podcast is going to be about. The next podcast will focus on a movie soundtrack and the soundtrack for that show is going to be Tron Legacy, the soundtrack written and performed by French electronic duo Daft Punk. Thank you very much, Gordon. Check out the Movie Muse website and Facebook and Twitter feeds for any updates on that and other activities. Thanks for listening and we'll be back soon.